Hey everybody, welcome to a brand new interview with composer Jimmy Laval. Uh, I'm sitting here with Jimmy right now, who is uh, an amazing musician, an instrumentalist, a composer. Uh, Jimmy, thank you so much for, for joining me today. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I love, I'm going to start with a, a small question, but big question as well, just to kind of set the, the, the foundation for where our conversation might go. And I'm just curious, what does music mean to you as a person, as an artist, as a storyteller? What does it mean in whatever sense you make of that? Wow. I, I mean, I, well, <laughs> all my years, I don't know that I've been asked that specifically, but um, yeah, I don't, I mean, I'm not sure what it means to me as a whole, like just as a, like, but I, to me, it's, uh, I mean, it's been a constant part of my everyday life for my entire life. So it's, I mean, I just feel like it's, I don't know, sets the, <laughs> sets the tone in the stage for, 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 for everything. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It means, it means a lot, I guess that's, but yeah, for it's, me, it's so... all I've ever known and focused on. So, so you know. yeah, let's talk about the, yeah. Um, it's all, if it's all you've ever known, I'm curious, let's go back to kind of your, your origin story. I'm curious when in your life, do you remember it? coming into your life like do you remember it just were you surrounded by music from the very start did you approach it did it approach you did you push away from it did you embrace it did it happen over a slow period of time i'm curious how did it start becoming part of your life yeah you know i'm not sure the exact like origins as far as like um whether or not it was pressed on me or something like that but i know that um when i was i started playing piano when i was four i had a piano in the house i had an older brother um, he's six years older than me. He played piano, um, you know, as a, just for fun as well. I don't remember if he took lessons or not, but he was really into music. Um, you know, this is like the, this is the eighties. So he's, you know, yeah. he was like into, he was like into like, you know, rat and Cinderella and like, you know, a lot of like hair metal glam bands, like from back then. And to be honest, I've never even mentioned that. I don't even know what it what relevance it has. But, but, um, but at any rate, I started playing piano when I was four. I started in lessons. Um, and so I don't know if it was something that I don't have a memory of my parents pushing it on me, and I don't have a memory of me like saying I want to do it. Um, yeah, you know, it's probably just the fact of like maybe I was there was a piano there, and so I started. Um, but anyways, like fast forwarding from there by the time I was in elementary school in third grade <clears throat> in third grade, there was like a, there was some kind of program with, um, you know, beginning elementary students that like one day a week, they went over to the middle school and like sat in or played with or watched or whatever. Um, the middle school orchestra. Um, so when I was in third grade, I started playing violin <clears throat> and, you know, would do that one day a week thing and go over. And then in fourth grade, I started playing uh, clarinet. So during that time, I was going over from the elementary school to the middle school twice a week, one day for band, one day for orchestra, playing clarinet and violin. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, fast forward to middle school, then now I'm like in the middle school band and orchestra playing violin and clarinet, um, you know, doing marching band and and stuff like that. Um and I think that from there, I was immediately drawn to the percussion section just because it's like, oh, who are all those guys in the back that are just like, you know, that like crew of like rug rats that are just, <laughs> you know, they just seem like they're just like up to no good. They're always getting called out by the conductor and just like, yeah, but yeah, they're like so powerful and like the whole, like the loudest thing. And so in sixth grade, I started playing in drumline, um, like doing the like drumline, uh, uh competition aside from the band you know yeah so i would march i would march clarinet and then you know on all those competitions and then afterwards i did the you know drum line and i started out in sixth grade as like fourth kick drum basically so or bass drum which means like i was essentially like the one on each you know <laughs> each <laughs> yeah. or whatever. it's like oh here it comes one you know uh, <laughs> Maybe it was a little more complex, but at any rate, by the time I was in eighth grade, I'd already converted completely over the percussion section. Um, I was like recruited to a high school across town to be to be on the snare line um, oh, wow. with all, all the other seniors. Um, so I was a freshman amongst three seniors um, playing snare. 
in marching band and um 10th grade i was drum captain um you know captain of the percussion section um playing the center snare and you know leading the charge writing charts for you know some of the percussion drumline performances and um and then in 11th grade or 10th grade was also the same year like the conductor changed and i didn't jive with her really well and i just mm -hmm. quit and and also during that time you know i started playing teaching myself how to play guitar um in ninth grade and that kind of like took over and led me down the path of starting to play in bands and i quit um band and orchestra after my sophomore year started playing music with a couple of other like people and like joining different bands here and there i wasn't ever the best guitar player in the room and i wasn't ever the best drummer in the room like, as far as drum set was concerned so i kind of like took on the role of i played bass or i played this i was kind of just like immediately kind of a multi-instrumentalist multi within those bands i was playing in and just kind of filling right. in here and there um but yeah i mean i don't know like fast forward again you know i was in the hardcore music scene in san diego um the late like late 90s and that kind of like is where i cut my teeth as far as starting to like tour um you know a summer of my senior year in 1996 was my first time that I went on tour through the States. And then the following fall, I was in touring in Europe. Um, so I was like 18 years old, like just traveling the country and touring all over the place. Um, and then obviously um, I kind of like grew out of the, I don't know, like in my heart of hearts and my music heart, I was always kind of into like really mellow music and like really inspired by like Brian Eno and, and um, you know, other kind of like, um i was drawn to like chopin and stuff like that like those were like kind of like my classical right. i was just more into like the melodic romantic emotional um um like you know parts of music um so i don't know um i started making i started this other band playing guitar um instrument it's this instrumental band called tristeza and we weren't supposed to be instrumental we were like planning my guitar player and i were planning on singing um came time to like basically our first show and we didn't have any words or any lyrics and we just kind of like continued on instrumentally um <laughs> and then that stuck and we stayed instrumental um and then you know flip side of that then i started to like do my own four track recordings as the album leaf um you know in the late 90s and yeah at eventually at some point like the album leaf kind of like took off over my main band i was like doing like more major tours with bigger bands like cigaros and you know playing playing in front of like larger audiences than my other band and um you know had more opportunities and so i stopped that and it's kind of full full fledged focused on the album leaf and i think like given the fact that i make primarily instrumental music um that basically led to a lot of kind of like film and tv sync placement um which you know gradually naturally kind of turned into me um around 2009 or so like starting to actually do film scoring right uh, and it was so it's kind of a natural progression as far as that's concerned um but yeah i mean that's yeah. pretty much my, my origin that's, story uh, that's such a unique path i love yeah. so talk to me about the album leap and going back to when you created kind of that project and how it has evolved into kind of your, you know, main source of like artistic creativity within music. And, you know, what, why did you want to create the album leaf and how has it evolved, I guess, since its inception? Yeah. Well, I mean, so when I was interested as a, as I alluded to earlier, I was kind of the multi-instrumentalist, like wore a handful of different hats. Um, right. And when I was in Tristeza, I was playing guitar um, and, um, during the same time I started playing, I was playing drums in this other band called, uh, go, go, go Earhart in San Diego. And <clears throat> in the room, there was a, um, one of the instruments he had in his living room where we practiced was a Fender Rhodes. And afterwards I kind of, you know, certain songs that I've written on guitar for Tristeza that didn't really like <clears throat> come to, you know, fruition or like, you know, like make, you know, like just like make the cut or get fully formed i kind of like noodled and played on the roads um you know i transcribed my guitar parts into excuse me what they would be um on the piano and the sound of the roads and stuff like that was just like whoa what is this this is incredible like i just yeah. love that um previous to that 
so so basically like previous to that i had been also experimenting with four track recording um and doing the same thing um and it wasn't like necessarily album leaf then but it definitely was like the beginnings of the album leaf was like me just making music um in my bedroom with a four track um most it was all guitar based um but i would also do things like it was raining and i'd put a microphone in the window and i'd film all that like natural ambient noise or mm -hmm. just like cars driving yeah. by or just doing that and kind of like you know, my idea was that like, this is what is happening while I'm creating this song. So I might as well be tracking and then taking that in too. You know, I was never like into, into the idea of like isolated recording, you know, like soundproofing and having everything really kind of, you know, like in the box yeah. like that. So I always wanted to capture everything else that was kind of going. And I still kind of stand by that um, to, to an extent. Um, but I mean, yeah, that, 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 so it kind of album leaf started as an outlet for me to kind of express myself, um, and use all the tools in my belt to create music and make songs. Um, so I would, you know, track guitar parts and then I would put drums on them then I would put keyboards on them then I'd play bass on it. And then I kind of have that thing like, okay, here's that, um, press, you know, makes a bunch of tapes and then sell them at like my trist at the shows at Tristezza shows for like a buck or so, you know, like. This is my solo stuff on the side or whatever. Um, yeah. And then, I mean, it, it kind of like, you know, Tristezza was kind of gaining more traction and we were touring a lot and we were having interest from a lot of like independent, you know, like labels and, and things like that. So we had kind of like a handful of offers on the table as far as like, you know, nothing major, just like, you know, like just like small independent, like single person run labels that press up like you know 107 inches or something like that and i was like signing to a label back then you know that kind of thing for that scene um but at any rate like i had a handful of those and that was kind of the point person for tristeza taking care of all of those kinds of like conversations and stuff like that but um so we had multiple offers and like we went with one and then another guy i really connected with another label i really liked um i said hey i have all this like four track stuff like you know if you're interested in releasing that like i have this um, and by that time I had actually going back to like the band I was playing drums and where I discovered the roads after practice, he would kind of be live tracking me on his eight track, um, noodling on the roads. And so naturally after that, I would kind of start, um, with him, um, you know, building those ideas into songs. And that basically eventually became my first record, um, an orchestrated rise to fall back in 1999. Yeah, um, released on this label called Music Fellowship, which is the label that wanted to release Tristezza, and we went with somebody else, and so I went there. And then again, our second label, our second um, album, then was with a little more of a reputable um, New York label, indie, um, you know, indie label, um, and they signed me as the album leaf as well as signing Tristezza. So I kind of, you know, had a like a bit of cash thrown my way to create my own little kind of modest, like digital, um, uh, recordings, you know, just like get a computer and get a mixer and get an interface and a microphone so they could start tracking into, you know, tracking into, into digital recording. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It was the same kind of thing where like I would write anything. I can't, at one point I remember like deeming it like if I wrote something on piano, that would be the album. If I wrote if I wrote something on guitar, then that would be Tristeza. And if I wrote something on guitar that didn't work for Tristeza or didn't, you know, didn't get fully realized, then I would either transcribe it to the roads or I would keep it on guitar. So um that was kind of how that was kind of how I don't know. <laughs> I, might have, I might have reverted back to your original yeah. question but like <laughs> no absolutely no 100 yeah. percent. but um so i mean you you were mentioning earlier that how like you, since your music kind of lent itself to being tracked into things and maybe put in tra temp tracks and people cutting stuff to it you kind of got into film music so i'm curious was that ever on your radar to do film tv or anything like that or and like when you got sucked into it what was your initial response was it like did you have like imposter syndrome you're like i don't know what i'm doing here did it, like or did, were you yeah, like I mean, oh I this is great this is what it, it inspires me i'm curious like <laughs> yeah i mean to be honest like i never really i never pictured a composer or even clued into that side of filmmaking like yeah. i never thought there's a musician or a composer in a room writing and creating scores for film. Like it just wasn't anything that like, 
I, I clued in on like, just thought of, you know, I knew that it existed, mm-hmm. you know, but I didn't know that like, Oh, this is what, you know, people do. I don't know. I, I just wasn't like, I, I just, I didn't equate. Um, I don't know. I was a huge fan of Danny Elfman and his scores. Um, and just, but I, but I thought of it as like a package deal. It's like, you yeah. know, cause he was with Tim Burton all the time. So I thought it was just like, I don't know. I just didn't, I just didn't know that that was like a path of music to be doing, you know? Um, but, but when you got into it, were you, were you like, Oh, this is, this is fantastic. Or were you scared of it at first? Were you like, Oh, sh-, like- I was like, I, I was so, I mean, the way that I could, so the first film that I did was this film called Tori's Distraction. Yeah. Um, it was a documentary, I think. Right. It was a documentary. Yeah. And basically the, the, the backstory of that was that the filmmaker, um, Tisha had used a ton of my, a, like a fair amount of my music as temp. Mm -hmm. Um, and so her initial, like her initial pitch to me was essentially, I mean, basically what happened was like, I was playing a show, um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico of all places. And (laughs) the support band that was playing with us, um, was a friend of the filmmaker of Tisha's Oh wow! and she sent a DVD with him saying, Oh, you're playing a show with this, with him. You know, I mean, this is back in 2009, 2007 or eight or something like that. I mean. I don't know. Did it, it? We've technology has advanced, but for whatever yes. reason, it wasn't so easy to like, you know. But at any rate, um, so she sent this DVD, and then we played the show together. He introduced himself. Um, we had a ton of mutual friends at the same time as well, just in the music scene. Um, he gave me the DVD, and and um, I literally like pop- popped it in my computer in the van, and would watch it watch the documentary and and you know with all the like chopping and like the freezing of like dvd players if anybody <laughs> remember that or, yeah. like, um but um but yeah i mean so and then i was just like oh this is this is a really powerful story this is a really you know i just can't believe like the backstory and the filmmaking that went into this and the commitment and just all of that stuff and i like at that point in time i was definitely i had a really successful licensing career um like with my music just being synced into you know tons of network tv and mostly tv not much film at all but mostly tv um and so i was kind of and my wife is also a filmmaker so she uh, you know we had she was in she was in school she was in mass she was in her master's program um for social documentation, um, you know, her, her medium was film and she was filming her thesis. Um, and it was something that I was going to be scoring doing the music for, um, there was other people that I met in her program that I kind of started to like, you know, like help them or make music with, um, their films. And so it was kind of like a, you know, and my, and she was also in, in, you know, new other directors and other filmmakers, um, that's kind of more moving forward. But, um, but at that point, that toys distraction moment, I basically saw this and I thought like, Oh, this is could be an opportunity for me to score something. And, you know, so I said like, how about I score the film? There was no budget. I did it for free. It was just like, this is something that was like, I wanted to toy with. I wanted to try. I wanted to, um, yeah, I don't know, test like, get my, yeah, get get your feet wet. Yeah. Whatever. (laughs) Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, so, so I basically like I, my approach to that was, uh, you know, since I don't know, my approach to that was a lot of sound alike, a lot of just like, oh, this is like this was the temp cue. So I'm like, I'm in that same vein. I'm not really right. like I definitely didn't have my own voice in scoring at, at, at all. Um, and I was more like knowing that, like, I know what I can do. I know what I'm capable of. I know that I can like I can make sound alikes of these things, you know, stuff like that. And so that was my initial approach. So a lot of those are, you know, quote unquote sound alikes, but they are, you know, I did, you know, make them my own um, yeah. in a big way. Um, and then from there, like I did another film called uh, Wonder Woman, um, story of, un, you know, untold super heroines. And it's a longer title than that. But, um, um, and there was kind of a bit of the same, like where the filmmaker had used a handful of my tracks. She was also friends with my wife, um, uh, um and and uh approached me about scoring and so i had a lot of kind of like back and forth with there like more just she was really kind of you know into her temp 
score cues as well. And then, and, and fair enough on that. It's like, it was a little more like spot on, like, you know, like, you know, I don't know. The story was, you know, about, um, you know, the strength of Wonder Woman and what, how she represented the feminist movement and just like, you know, the different voices with, um, within the movement and following like Gloria Steinem and just like, you know, through the decades and how her kind of role. Um, and so there was a lot of music used, you know, like, I don't know, like Bikini Kill or like the Tigra, right. just like a lot of more like, you know, so it wasn't necessarily like the right thing for me to like do something that wasn't kind of in that line. So, you know, I ended up doing some sound likes like that. And, but that was where like I brought in like a friend of mine to come sing. Like she, and she wrote these like really clever lyrics and, and you know, just like kind of around the film. So that was kind of like more like starting to like, okay, and like this is a little bit, but I still didn't really feel, and you know, I, I definitely did not have my voice at that point in time either. So it was more like imposter. Um, for the most part, just like doing yeah. sound alikes and um, you know, really like sticking to the temp. Um, and you know, not really coming to myself. But I think you know, mostly with my wife's filmmaking, um, her name's Kate Trumbull Laval, like um, that was where I was more so coming into I was able to kind of find my voice in scoring through her films. Um, and also with Justin, Justin and Aaron, um, who I've been yeah. working with a very long time. Um so it, must have, it allowed you just to be a little bit more vulnerable and just take maybe a chance, especially yeah. if you had that kind of safety net, especially if you're working with your wife or people you know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So when did you meet, uh, like, I mean, talking about, you mentioned Justin and Aaron, who have, I mean, you've done, you know, all these films with them and of course, Something in the Dirt, um, which we'll talk about, but I'm curious how you, how was it just in that kind of filmmaker circle that you met them and how did they kind of, how did you kind of, because it seems like you guys are like a perfect match for the, for your sonic world and their visual yeah. world. You guys are just like a match made in heaven. So I'm curious, how did it, how did it come together? And was it like an instant chemistry when you guys uh, first met or did it take time to kind of build up a relationship? <laughs> And that's thanks for that compliment. That's that's a cool compliment too. Um, but um, so the story with us is actually Justin was hired um as a cinematographer to film me um making a record. Um, oh wow! In two thousand five. Um, so Justin, I think, was like right out of film school. Um, um, he's a couple years younger than me. Um, and he basically my 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 manager at the time had like, you know, devised this whole, like, let's film you making this record. Um, and it was into the blue again. So that, that, that thing that Justin shot lives on YouTube, you know, like yeah. really just to, 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 to see it. Um, at any rate. Um, so yeah, he followed me, he followed me on tour. Um, did like a short little weekend run with, with, with me. He went with me to uh, Seattle where I tracked the record excuse me, he went to me, he went with me to Iceland where I mixed the record and he was just there. He was there the entire time. And, and, um, and that's kind of how we met. Yeah. Um, I didn't really, he was really quiet. Um, he did, you know, he did his job. He has, as a cinematographer, it was just kind of like, you know, off yeah. in the distance or like wherever it was like made himself invincible, you know, just like was, 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 you know, did that really, really well. And, um, so basically that's when I met Justin, um, and then fast forward, I don't even think, you know, we like kept in touch at all or, or anything like that. Um, I think maybe here and there um, for the most part, but, you know, I didn't know what his path was. I didn't know what, you know, he was doing, what he was up to or, you know, anything like that. So um, 2012, I can't remember the exact year, but I moved to LA in 2011 um, and you know, obviously Justin was here too. He had since uh, met Aaron um, and they had made resolution. Um, Justin reached out and was like, I wrote this script, you know, spring. And, you know, I just thought like, I just was listening to your music the entire time I was hearing it. And, you know, I wrote to it and it, you know, it'd be, I don't know, want to talk to you about scoring the film. Let's grab a beer. Whatever. Yeah. So we met up and I met Aaron and we know we caught up or whatever. And I, I hadn't seen or heard or known a resolution or anything that they had done. Um, and at that point, I, you know, I didn't really, um, sorry, my dog is chewing my, uh, <laughs> no worries. my bass trap. Um, <laughs> That's what dogs need to do. <laughs> um, yeah. 
I don't know why he's so, so obsessed with that. Hey. <laughs> um, come here. There you go. Good boy. Sorry. Um, <laughs> anyways. Um, so yeah, so we met up. We had we we met up. We had a beer, and and they gave me the script, like printed out script. Um, and yeah. um, or maybe it was emailed. I don't know. I, I can't remember, but uh, I feel like it was a a a. A, a stack you know yeah um, just like at any rate <laughs> and then they also gave me a dvd resolution and um i went home and was like oh this is cool like i, I hadn't really done much you know i'd only done documentary i hadn't done any narrative and um i just thought like oh yeah this is cool like this you know i didn't know i, I had no clue I, I didn't know anything about it and then i went home and first i watched my, my wife and i we watched resolution and i was just like oh whoa this is this is this is a movie like i you know i was just like wow this is this is we were scared we were just like well well you know like the sound yeah. design and everything and it was just like this is cool and really really genuinely blown away and surprised by this you know my memory this kid that followed me making a record way back when you know unassuming didn't know just you know hadn't kept up with and it was just like wow this is incredible yeah um and um so immediately i was like yeah let's let's do spring for sure and the initial thing that we did was like this really kind of like teaser clip um like almost like pitch pitch thing that we that we that they had shot um you know aaron's really vfx savvy um you know his cinematography is really brilliant um you know justin's storytelling it's just like the two of them as a duo are just really dynamic and just kind of um and that was really kind of um, you know, apparent when they, when they brought that first little, um, snippet with me and also Yael, the sound designer, um, and sound mixer and re-recording mixer. And, um, you know, uh, he also came over and was brought in at that point too. So, I mean, he's been, he's been along the entire route as well. Um, wow. Yael and I, and, um, so anyways, like, you know, they came over and they gave me that clip and I scored that clip and that ended up being, um, I think it's I mean, it's a handful of different themes in within spring, but you know mostly it's like arrival, and um, I think it's also I forget what the uh, not arrival. Um, more, I don't, there's another that's another cue in another one of their movies. I can't remember what I've named all this all these cues, but um, <laughs> they're all living um, in your head somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know. Um, any anyway, <laughs> um. <clears throat> Anyways, yeah, so that theme had kind of like been an early theme and and then yeah, fast forward we we then, you know, did 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 the film and I feel like I learned a lot from that. Um I think the way that we worked together was really kind of, you know, cemented and they I think learned from me as much as I learned from them. They like they learned the language of of how to communicate and and kind of express what they want from from the composer what they're thinking of musically or you know all of those things and um um yeah i mean i i think one of the you know behind the scenes one of the like i i had no idea how to kind of like create a like a medley of theme or just like something like that but like the final yeah. final monologue closing of spring you know, was totally concocted by the three of us, um, or mostly by Justin and Aaron. Um, and my memory serves, I think it was more Aaron was like, what do we start here? We go into this theme, we go to that thing, and then we hit that theme and we're out, you know, like, and and, and I was like, oh, yeah, like, whoa. And, I, you know, that was something that they had guided and and heard. Um, and so I think just like that, that like, you know, relationship and and um, collaborate, collaborative sense between the two of us like we just kind of really like fell into place with spring yeah, absolutely um, and then yeah coming back on the endless and it was just like okay cool and then I, by then i had kind of like then really started to i feel like the endless was more so where i started to find my film voice i think spring is kind of a an extension of the album leaf scoring a movie um, yeah and i think that um the endless is more when i kind of fell into finding my own my kind of path as a, a, a sound as a composer i guess you know that was kind of separate from you know more thematically or melodic themes that i kind of 
will gravitate towards with the album leaf. Right. Absolutely. And then after that, I mean, you did Synchronic, which I think is, I remember discovering that score and really uh, kind of falling into your music with that, with that film. And I remember kind of immersing myself in your world and stuff like that. And then now with something in the dirt, which uh, just recently came out, I mean, so, which is again, fantastic. And so congratulations. I mean, that's just yeah. wonderfully amazing, mesmerizing. I mean, so I'm, I'm just curious what, uh, like, maybe we'll just focus on Aaron and Justin and what your process is with them, because I'm sure it's going to be differing from if you're working on a solo project, if you're working with a band, I'm sure this, this question might, will apply differently, but if you're working with Justin and Aaron, I'm curious where for you, where does the first note come from? What is kind of your go-to place for inspiration? Do you, do you automatically start coming up with ideas the second they bring you in and show you that script? Do you, do you have to sit and fiddle around where you're sitting right now and try to find a tone or a sound, or I'm curious, or, or is it just completely different on every project? Or do you have kind of like a go-to process to kind of get that first journey, like uh, idea out of your head? Um, <clears throat> well, it differs. It, it definitely do differs filmmaker to filmmaker, just, just in the sense of like the point in which I've been brought on. Sure. Yeah. Um, but with Justin and Aaron, particularly since we're talking about that, um, I'm brought on with the script. Like I'm, I'm before they've shot, before they've done anything, they, I, I get a script, um, and I, you know, start reading. Typically, within those first, within the first two pages, I've thinking of something. Yeah, yeah I've pictured something. Um, you know, I'm picturing what, what, what it might look like. I'm hearing something I'm thinking, you know, just whatever it's like. And so that, that kind of like, it happens really kind of early on, um, yeah. whether or not that sticks, um, in this particular case, like I read the script, um, and then immediately came up with, um, kind of my, you know, main theme that kind of, um, for something in the dirt, for something in the dirt, um, oh, wow. based solely off the script however i second guess that theme for about six months and i didn't ever come back to it i was like and i fiddle i had that film for a really long time and i'm like i don't know what i'm doing i have no idea what, what am i, I think i was reading you posted you said you described it as a mind fuck uh, as to score it was a film. mind yeah as much as the film was is a mind fuck it's like that my score was also the process was also a mind fuck um <laughs> and the reason being is because i had the script and um i created like a bunch of bunch of stuff around the script mm. um, they shot the film um they typically i think they yeah they had their own process as far as like how they work with michael um felker their editor um the, the three of them all edit so you know yeah um, they have a process where you know justin and aaron spend a lot of time on it they send it to michael michael does a bunch of stuff on it sends it back to Justin. you know the advice for kind of kind of that kind of thing um during that time I'm working, I'm doing, you know, stuff and, and, um, are they cutting to like work. old stuff or are they just not using any temp? Or are they just coming up They're with some sort of structure? Temp. They, they They're use temp. temp. Um, okay. they'll, they'll use, they'll even use like, you know, they'll use things from synchronic from the endless of my yeah. score. Yeah. They also use, you know, like, I don't know, the witch or, or, or like minutes, you know, just like they, I mean, there's, they, they're, they're, um, they're finding a palette kind of, they're finding their palette. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't necessarily, it's not always my score, you know, but, um, right. Um, they find their palette and um, this particular, this thing. So all of their, like all of, you know, John and Levi's um, <clears throat> all of John and Levi's theorizing segments um, where they're really getting into the nitty gritty of the symbols they're seeing and the, this and the, that, and like, Oh, well, what about like, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the breaking down of all of the different, you know, kind of cult themes and just all, all of the stuff that they're trying to uncover and figure out um, all of those things. The temp was this Philip glass piece um, from, I forget that I, I knew it off the top of my head, but now it's been so, and I think I tried to forget about it so hard that I really <laughs> forgot about it because that was really what threw me for a loop because it was, was it like, one of those like kind of squatsy or the old, like one of those, the docs that he, that he did. No, it was um ah, I forget what it was, but um anyways, it was it, it was a, probably a minimalist looping something. <laughs> exactly. It yeah. was like it was minimal and it was like um um and yeah, it just threw me for a loop. I was just like, oh God, this is not what I was thinking at all. Yeah. Um that and also when I saw a picture, I was like, 
whoa, this is not what I was thinking at all either. Like, look at Justin's hair. Look at Aaron's got a beard. Like, whoa, this is, you know, just like all of these things. I was thrown off by that and the palette yeah. and the, just all of all this stuff. And, the, and that typically is the case always. Like I read the script and I picture something and then I get it from them. And it's just like, wow, like the, this, this is, this is fantastic. It's not at all what I pictured, you know, in, in right. any way. Um, but yeah, so I mean that coupled with, you know, this like temp track of like Philip Glass all over the place and um um you know other stuff um just really threw me for a loop and I really kind of like fumbled for a long time. I had come up with like 30 demos and 30 pieces of of ideas. Oh wow. Um, all of which I thought I'm like no, none of, the, none of this is none of this is going to work, you know, and back and forth back and forth back and forth until finally, yeah, I mean I went back to that original theme. Um, it is, you know, this. This whole like kind of like synth loop that I found and like. Like that, that, that was basically like what that was my initial patch that I like my initial synth sound that I created um, yeah. right from the script. Um, and then it also has kind of this choral, like, um, you know, oh, like thing over it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I went back to that and then I broke it down more. And so I kind of like went off that cue and then I broke it down more where I had, um, Or if I hit the same note, it's like constantly changing. Yeah, for anyone listening, um, I, the, I think the Zoom's noise cancellation is doing a good job of clipping. So I'm hearing a little bit, but it's like, okay, cool. It's just like the, the <laughs> sucking the sound out. Yeah. So for whoever's listening, uh, Jimmy is playing on <laughs> playing some notes, but if you're not hearing it all the way, that's because of <laughs> Zoom's amazing noise auto noise cancellation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so that, like, tone that's changing and changing and changing like with it like kind of like led me into the oh, 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 oh. and then i just sampled my voice and then like kind of i don't know that kind of led me off to the races as far as like coming to like find like okay this is my direction and my path and then the other thing about this philip glass cue was that there was a flute and i thought the flute worked really well um and so i'd never worked with a you know a, a flautist or a woodwind player or had done any of those things in my score um and basically um you know sought out to find um asked around um asked my violinist that i work with all the time um if he knew anyone and he did and she and i just like reached out to her and she absolutely killed it and just like as i kind of like was coming coming to and getting my my cues in order um you know she basically recreated each one of them in the voice of woodwinds bass clarinet clarinet wow. so with that i was able to kind of dissect and like make thematic changes and have the same cue play but like in a different sense and also being able to like play it more more jokingly more seriously more this more that you know um so so yeah i mean eventually it came to <laughs> eventually i found the way and then there was other things that were like kind of like you know, tonal things that were easier to do um, or came a little bit more naturally. But for the most part, yeah, it took me a long time to kind of like go down all of these other different paths and then eventually just come right back to where I started. Do you enjoy that process? Do you enjoy kind of wandering out? Is that like part of the exploratory process for you? Or is that a frustrating part of it where you're like, God, I just want to find my freaking sound so I can just have foundation and build off of it? Incredibly frustrating. I yeah. Mean, it's yeah, I've done um, I've done two films since, and I and it's the same it's the same process each time. Like I'm on, I just did another um, like kind of horror comedy film um, for uh, X Y Z called uh, the filmmakers Adam Mason. We we previously actually did this film for Hulu as a part of the, the uh, Into the Dark series called They Come Knocking, um, and then he did this film. It's called Baby Blue. It'll be out. I don't know when, but at any rate, same thing. Like it took me a really long time. I did all of these ideas and all of this stuff. Nothing worked, nothing worked. And then it's really frustrated. And I start to think like, oh, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to like, I'm going to get, I, I'm not going to be able to, I got to quit. I don't know what I'm doing, you know? 
And I found my way there. And then right now I'm on this three-part doc series, which is a polar opposite of everything that I just did. It's And and um, I'm in that process right now where I'm just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I second guess myself. I've got all this stuff. And I wrote a bunch and they have it temped in. And, and essentially my score is already there. It's just a matter of me, you know, bringing it to life. And I'm in that process where I'm just like, <laughs> yeah you're, you're in the weeds right now yeah <laughs> do you like to do you like to write away from picture at all and like try to create suites and soundscapes or do you like to focus yeah. on a scene and the structure and and do that yeah again it's 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 project by project case by case like you know yeah. I, I certain picture can be really inspiring certain picture can't um i like to create a lot of motifs and different things and different sound palettes like experimenting with different you know trains you know chains of of sound and effects and and creating new sounds and new palettes and um and then being able to kind of bring those into some sort of thematic thing you know i don't know it's it's it, it varies really um yeah. yeah it really varies well i love i just love how you're uh especially with your stuff with uh justin and Aaron, how it I mean, the, the album for something in the dirt on its own, it's like its own kind of listening experience. And I remember just putting my headphones on and just closing my eyes and just disappearing with it. But also when you put it against the picture, it just, I mean, brings that world. Uh, it just expands it like incredibly. And I mean, that's a whole, the film itself, if anybody hasn't checked it out or know Justin and Aaron's work, is very kind of this cosmic, you know, ideas and, and these color palettes and tones and textures and stuff like that. And your score really does kind of really fit in there. So I'm curious when you were working on something in the dirt, was there like a, a moment, uh, is there a part of the film that was really just really rewarding to score or maybe a certain sound or palette that you came up with, maybe certain instruments or textures that you're like, Oh, this is really cool. And I really love living in this world right now while you're like building it and, and sculpting it. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I, I feel like the entire score is that for me. Like I'm yeah. really, really psyched on it i'm really psyched on the like on the palette i'm on the woodwind performances the bass clarinet the you know the string performance from jake um i think is one of his best it really helped um each each contribution from um with this particular score i only worked with jake and haley um <clears throat> but both of them <clears throat> excuse me both of them what they brought amplified and and brought you know allowed me to go in further directions of just like really crafting you know enough tonal difference and enough melodic shift and enough like to kind of keep this entire keep the themes in line have them really not be repetitive feel repetitive feel um um yeah, monotonous and. Is there any improvising? Do you allow your solos to improvise at all, or oh, are you? Absolutely, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, a lot of the the flute. There's a lot of kind of like solo wailing flute, really. Mm -hmm. You know, over um over Levi's scenes, and that was you know to support his kind of his like whimsical, positive kind of outlook. Um, like really kind of, he seems very innocent. Um, just really wants to has these, you know, dreams and desires to like, just be fully like, he's really independent. He wants to be, his, you know, do his own thing, live on the, live off the land and, and just like be, you know, just kind of like a, almost like a fairy tale thought or something like that, you know, so like the flute really kind of like resonated yeah. with, um, and actually Justin and Aaron were in the room when I got her parts back and we listened to that flute. We're just like, Whoa, what is that? Like, just like, <laughs> this is crazy. Like, she's just really like, I mean, she's, she's an insane soloist, um, jazz soloist. Um, and she plays with a lot of large, she's like done things with like Beyonce and like, you know, she's, she's, she's really kind of up there and, and, wow. um, um, under yeah. the radar, but just like, she's in incredible as far as her performance. And we were just like, Whoa, this is crazy. And so, I don't know, I did things like I slowed, slowed her solos down to half speed. I, I pitch shifted things here and there. And that's part of my process as well, where like, as much as I, you know, their performance is there, it also like inspires me to some further manipulate it. And that's just part of my like kind of scoring and sound process. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the improv, I think is the most important. Um, and that's exactly what, you know, I've given, I give them kind of specific things that I want 
doubled or tracked or created. And yeah. then I say, then do your thing. Um, whatever you hear, you know, it's, it can be as simple as like, oh, I hear this melody. Like I think with John's theme, there was a like that kind of thing. And I wanted the, wanted the violins to double that. And I wanted the, you know, clarinet to really like hit those, like, you know, that like minor, like, you know, the little like minor third to four, you just like that, like those like notes and stuff like that. Um, but then, and then I take those takes and then I, yeah, further manipulate, pitch shift, rearrange, read thing. And, and, you know, just, it just like really creates a whole second life to like, I feel like there's my scores will exist in two zones, like the pre the zone where people have not played on it yet. And then the post of that. And after that, it then like develops even more. So, yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, the final result is, is incredible. I mean, congratulations on something in the dirt and for the album, finally, I mean, to be have, have it released out in the world. Um, it's an incredible album experience as well, as well as, as in the film. And I guess to, uh, to, to, to wrap things up, I'm curious um, if you could, and you, you've, you've kind of gotten into the music side of things and you're working with all these really great young auteur filmmakers. And I'm curious if as a, as a, as a musician, as a composer and as a storyteller, if you had like a, the opportunity to, to pick any other job on a film to try for a day, which one would you pick? If you could if you do editing, if you could do acting or you can do, I mean, I had John Powell tell me he wants to be a stunt man. I'm curious <laughs> what, <laughs> what, if you could try anything for a day, just on something else on a film besides the music what would you do <laughs> i don't i mean i i i uh, my mind went to like like cinematography acting like uh, you know like i i did all of these different things um or i thought of all these different things yeah. and we're actually um for a split second my family um is in the endless um there's like a shot where they're like pretty much in the beginning of the movie um you know justin's character looks over to to see this family um sitting in the park and that's us um my wife and kids but um yeah so i guess we've acted but <laughs> i guess i've acted no, i'm just kidding you got um, your cameo. yeah you got i don't know composer cameo <laughs> yeah totally um um i don't know i mean i think like if the stuntman thing just like threw me for a loop like that would be fun <laughs> That'd be that's cool. Um, I could do that. That'd be that. That could be that could be something really fun to be a top man. <laughs> Completely on the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> definitely don't want to direct. I definitely. I would love to shoot. I think cinematography is fun. Um, sound design is fun. Editing seems tough. Yeah, editing is hard. Being on set, it's crazy. Like this, it's it's insane. What I like, like. I feel like I learn a little bit more of the filmmaking process as I go. Like, I still feel like I'm, you know, pretty naive as far as like how things are shot or like what goes into in the backstory in the back. I don't know for this last film that I'm sorry if I'm rambling on, but like, no, no, please, like yeah. this last, this last film for the, for baby blue. Um, I went to a couple of the shoots and um, just watching the, like the actors um, do this scene that in the end is like a minute, you know, it's like, they did it. They did like, I don't know, six or seven takes, all of which were great. And it was just like, okay, do it again, do it again, different angles. And it was just like, there was only two cameras. And so he's covering, you know, each angle as with each shoot. So they just keep doing it, they keep doing it. And then in the end, it's like, oh, whoa, it's like, it's totally quiet. It's like, sounds like a bustling restaurant. It sounds like a, you know, like, and then like, oh, I remember like the, the lines are not the same. They're improving also the entire time. So he's yeah. picking which lines he likes and which shot it's like, it's just like, it's so cool to like, think of it that in that way that like, you know, it's not just like five cameras on a tripod with different angles. It's like, they're just like repeatedly doing these things and being edited together. So the editing, it's like, oh, that's kind of cool to like, take the, you know, take the, this and take the, I don't know. It's, it's uh, it's impressive. I think it's you know, a fascinating. I mean, that's why I fell in love with filmmaking because it's like it's there's so many moving pieces. There's so many things that, and you don't realize. I think a lot of people don't realize. Uh, if you, I mean, if you're listening or watching this interview, I'm, you're probably into filmmaking and and, but um, like just like a, you know, two hours for you as a viewer, it could it's like you know, two to five years of somebody else's life, and you know, <laughs> but right. there's so much that goes into it, and it's 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 such a fascinating thing to me that like, oh yeah, this one dialogue scene, but yeah, it's like. 
yeah, you have to have add the you know the wild audio and the and the surrounding you know the, the atmosphere and every little sound effect, the footsteps, the foley, the ADR. Every, it's just like oh, it all comes <laughs> so much. <laughs> The flip side of that, though, is like that I think is really funny is like um, I, don't, I don't know why, but like the the movie um, is it Father of the Bride, I think. Oh, uh, you just <laughs> named one of my wife's favorite my one of my wife's favorite movies. Okay, cool. Then you know, then you should know what I'm talking about. The opening scene, I think, where he's just like, Dan or is it? Par I think it's Father of the Bride, where he's like, he's like, oh, and he's like doing this like whole like vocal singing thing, and he's like running around, and he's like, you know, this whole thing and stuff like that. <laughs> And like he's so big and like loud and just like yeah. you know, the performance is so huge and it's surrounded by this you know massive score or whatever it is and and um uh which I think is John Williams actually to be to, I think Father of the Bride was Sylvester from if I recall oh you're right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. So those yeah that's right because those theme, his themes are just like there's a lot of the you, you know a Sylvester theme so there's Steve Martin like being like large and giant and all you know larger than life running all over the place and the mean and then, and then like in reality it's totally quiet yeah there's like 30 40 people watching him do this thing it's like <laughs> to think about like like I don't know the vulnerability of like you know just like throwing yourself out there and like being that yeah. loud you know, it's like, oh, okay, there, there, there's the there. And then having to trust in the funny because yeah, your, per like yeah, your performance shapes completely different the edit. You know, it can be yeah. completely different yeah. than what was on set. So, which is what reality TV shows you <laughs> if you're no, watching. Totally. But just like the silence of, you know, I don't know. It's just, yeah. it's funny to me. Like when I think about like those, like I'll be watching a movie once and I'll just be like, oh, you know, what's funny. It's like totally quiet in the room right now. Like <laughs> on their end, you know, <laughs> have, you, have you seen that? Uh, it's on YouTube. Somebody like recreated the end of star Wars during the, the ceremony uh, or it's just nothing but score, but they just took the music, John Williams music out and just recreated the sound design. So you just hear people like, <clears throat> like coughing and like the <laughs> rustling of people sitting and it's just silent and they're all standing there, you know, with their medals and <laughs> chewy. It's like, Arr! and it's just like, <laughs> silent <laughs> so it's That's really incredible. good yeah <laughs> totally like case in point like that yeah it's and i mean do go back to your original question your very first question like music is very important it's very yeah. important so yeah, well, that's a, I think a perfect way to 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 wrap it up, uh, Jimmy. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time and 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 chit chatting and taking us into your process a little bit. It was uh, fascinating, illuminating. So thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs>